than ever before, companies and government agencies find themselves locked in risk controversies with an angry or frightened public. Dr. Peter Sandman of Rutgers University presents his formula for responding to public concern, the most perplexing problem in risk communication. Thank you. Let me tell you a little bit more about my background. Uh, I'm a specialist in what's called risk communication. And risk communication, I think, means at least two very different things. One of the things it means, and I, I've been doing this for nigh on 20 years now, is figuring out how to scare people. What do you do when the flood is coming and folks won't evacuate? Uh, how do you get people to test their homes for radon, to uh, use a seatbelt, to uh, use a condom, to quit smoking? All issues where the experts tell us the hazard is serious and the public's response tends to be apathetic, where the job of risk communication is to shake people by their collective lapels and say, look here, this is dangerous, this could kill you, do something. That's risk communication. The other thing I do, I've been doing for only six or seven years now, and that's figuring out how to calm people down again. What do you do when the experts tell you, when the evidence tells you that the hazard isn't all that serious and the public's going bananas? What do you do when anxiety about the risk is a greater threat to health than the risk itself? Okay. So we have these two very different things, both called risk communication. On the one hand, trying to alert people, on the other hand, trying to reassure people. Now, I try not to do both at the same time on the same issue. Okay, among consultants, that counts as ethics. It doesn't take a lot to count as ethics among consultants. Okay. But, but I think it's very important for me to stress at the beginning that I have no independent expertise at all as to which of those two skills is called for. Uh, that is, I am not as some of you are, a specialist in risk assessment. I don't know whether dimethyl meatloaf is going to kill people. Okay. What I do is figure out whether it's going to piss people off. Okay. And, and what we're going to be doing today is talking about risk, not in terms of does it kill people, but in terms of does it piss people off. And one of the important things to say about that is you look at these two kinds of risk communication, on the one hand alerting people to the risk, on the other hand reassuring them, is that they're both difficult. Now that may come as a surprise to you if you've done one for a long time. Uh, suppose, for example, you spent a lot of time trying to reassure publics, trying to, trying to uh, calm them down, to keep them from being overly upset about a risk. You may think, gee, wouldn't it be easy to try to alarm people? Wouldn't it be easy to work for Greenpeace? Uh, might not pay so well, but uh, you know, would, would, wouldn't that be a piece of cake to go into a community and scare people? And the answer is no, it's not easy. Turns out it's terribly difficult. Uh, you, can, you can work very hard trying to get an audience upset about a risk. You can spend years uh, and get no place. It is, it is hard. In fact, the natural state of humankind vis-a-vis -vis risk is apathy. Most people on most risks, most of the time, are apathetic. And it's very hard to get them upset. Okay. But as a lot of you know through personal experience, it is also hard once they're upset to get them apathetic again, okay. to get the genie back into the bottle. So, so both of these two tasks, it turns out, are, are difficult. And in fact, uh, that is the cardinal principle of risk communication. If you took a long list of hazards uh, and you rank ordered them by something like expected annual mortality, how many people they kill in a good year, okay, and you take the same list of hazards and rank order them by how upsetting they are to people, how distressing they are to people, the correlation between the two rank orders is approximately 0.2. Okay. Some of you know statistics. You can square the correlation to get the percentage of variance accounted for. A glorious 4% of the variance. That is, and here, is, here it is without numbers, the risks that kill people and the risks that upset people are completely different. Okay. But completely different in a symmetrical way. There are, as you know, risks that upset people even though they're not killing very many. There are also, as you may have neglected to notice, risks that kill lots of people without upsetting anybody. Okay. And what we need to figure out today is why that's true. Now, I'm going to focus more on the issue of why are people upset 
about risks even when the experts don't, don't see any basis for that concern. Uh, why do people exaggerate risk? I'm going to focus on that not because it's the more important problem. The more important problem, obviously, is when people are dying and not taking the risk seriously enough. I'm going to focus on the other one not because it's more important but because it's tougher. Okay? Because institutions seem to be having, institutions in government, in industry, in other, in other organizations, seem to be having enormous difficulty understanding how to deal with concerned publics, with overly concerned, or what looks to be overly concerned publics. So I'm going, I'm going to focus on, on that one. The core problem, the core problem we're trying to focus on is this miserable correlation. Okay, this very low 0.2 correlation between the risks that upset people and the risks that injure people, that damage people, that kill people. Okay. Now, the question is why that low correlation? And that's a question that, that may strike some of you as a silly question, as an obvious a question with an obvious answer. Uh, the traditional answer of industry, for example, toward the question, why is the public afraid of the wrong risks, is very straightforward. The public's afraid of the wrong risks because the public's dumb, okay. <laughs> which often translates to never went to engineering school. Okay. R raise your hand if you're an engineer. How many engineers do we Ah, yes, you know what I mean, okay? Never went to engineering school. It follows that people are irredeemably irrational. Uh, they will therefore be manipulated by sensational mass media and communist environmental groups. Okay, and you're, you're smiling like, well, he got that right anyway. Okay, and if that's true, then it follows that the right way to deal with the public vis-a-vis -vis risk is not to deal with the public vis-a-vis -vis risk. Uh, ignore them if you can, mislead them if you have to, uh, if you're in extreme circumstances, lie to them, but for heaven's sake, don't level with them because they'll screw it up. Okay? And that is, I think, the traditional attitude of industry and for that matter of government, of experts in general, toward the public on risk controversies. Now, that attitude has changed, I think, uh, only because it's had to. Uh, little by little, company after company, uh, agency after agency, have discovered that that attitude doesn't work. Okay? That when you leave people out, that when you ignore people, uh, they get more angry, they get more frightened, they interfere more in policy, and the outcome is a kind of a policy gridlock, an outcome that's not good for public health, not good for public policy, not good for anything. So little by little, institutions have moved to a second explanation. Okay, they say, it's not that the public is irredeemably irrational. The problem is we haven't explained ourselves well enough. Okay. If only we sent our experts for media training. Uh, if only our charts were visible from the back of the room and in color instead of black and white. Okay. If, 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 if only we could talk in English instead of jargon, then the problem would be solved. Okay. Now, that's a progressive change. To go from let's ignore the public to, uh, uh, to, to let's educate the public is real progress. And uh, not least of its advantages is it's sending my children to college. Okay, so I, 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 mean, I, I, I don't want to knock it, but I have to tell you it's based on a false diagnosis. Okay, that is, if you have in the back of your mind the idea that there is a slideshow such that when you get 300 angry citizens in a high school gymnasium, you show them the slideshow and they say, oh, now I get it. Okay, and they go home and watch television. No, there's no such slideshow. I would be delighted to teach you how to make that kind of slideshow if there was such a slideshow, but there isn't. Okay, so what am I saying? I'm trying to kind of sweep away the underbrush. It's not that people are stupid. It's not that people can't figure out the data. People, in fact, do figure out the data. People are extraordinarily good at figuring out probabilistic data when they want to. They do it when they go to Las Vegas. They do it when they buy a mortgage. Uh, I would put a variable rate mortgage up against any risk assessment that's been done in the United States to date as a complex probabilistic document, uh, and people figure them out. And it's not that you've done such a poor job of explaining yourselves. You can do a better job. Presentational skills do matter. But, but you haven't done that bad a job of educating the public, of explaining the risks. And we still have this miserable point to correlation between whether it's going to kill people and whether it's going to upset them. So the question is, why that correlation? I'm going to try to answer that question. Now, the word we're talking about is risk. Now, I, I suspect most of you know what risk means uh, to experts, to risk, to risk assessors. But if you don't, it's very straightforward. It's a multiplication of two factors, magnitude 
Okay, how bad is it when it happens? Times probability, how likely is it to happen? You get your best measure of magnitude, your best measure of probability, you multiply those by each other, and you come out with something like expected annual mortality. Okay, and you, you know you have a future in risk assessment if you can say expected annual mortality with a smile. Okay. Okay. They, don't, they don't just expect it, they look forward to it. Okay. Now, now, sometimes that calculation of magnitude times probability is based on hard data. Automobile fatalities, for example, we can go out on the highway and count them. For most risks that lead us to big controversies, though, it's not based on hard data at all. If we look at SARA Title III, we look at uh, most of the risk controversies that dominate our society, and the data are not at all hard. And I suspect most of you know this. If, we, if we're talking about acute risk, we're looking at a branch of magic called fault tree analysis. Uh, and if we look at chronic risk, then we are trying to reason from what happens to small numbers of rodents exposed to one substance at a time in large quantities for short periods of time and to make judgments about what might happen to large numbers of human beings exposed to small quantities of lots of substances at once over a long period of time. Okay. That is to say, we all know what part of their bodies risk assessors pull those numbers out of. <laughs> Now, as a social scientist, I have to tell you that's a source of great satisfaction to me. After, after 20 years of working with technical people, at last I found a technical field sloppier than my own. <laughs> it, it may not make you similarly happy, but in any case, whether the data are hard or soft, and they're usually soft in this field, what risk means to risk assessors is this multiplication of magnitude times probability. And the problem is that's not what risk means to anybody else may not even be what risk means to risk assessors when they go home at night, but at least in the office they mean magnitude times probability, and no one else does. So let's play fast and loose with the terminology. Let's redefine terms. Let's take what the risk assessor means by risk, this multiplication of magnitude times probability, and for the next couple of hours, let's call that hazard. Then let's take what the public means by risk, all the things that people are worried about that experts ignore, and I'm going, to, I'm going to disaggregate that. I'm going to spread those things out in a minute, but for the moment, let's look at it as one thing and call it outrage. And that leads to the only math I want to offer you today, a new definition of risk. I would suggest that properly considered, risk is hazard plus outrage. Now that that plus sign upsets people sometimes, particularly technical people. So for those of you with a technical background, I have a different definition. Risk is a function of hazard and outrage. Uh, if you don't know what that means, that means hazard plus outrage in their code. Okay. But they, somehow they find that much more precise. Now, this is a redefinition that makes a difference, and let me try to explain why. The way the problem is usually seen, and remember, the problem is this miserable point two correlation between whether it's going to kill you and whether it's going to upset you. The way that problem is usually seen is as a problem of misperception. Okay? It's as if the experts were in direct contact with the platonic essence of risk, while the public was denied that direct contact, forced to perceive the risk and doing a crummy job. Okay, so that, you know, if you read the literature or if you listen to experts talking to each other, they're all the time saying, the public just doesn't understand, the public just doesn't get it, doesn't perceive the risk accurately. Let's, let's get a test on that. Would you raise your hand if you have ever said that to a colleague, the public just doesn't understand, doesn't perceive the risk correctly? Lots of hands. Good, I'm talking to the right audience. Okay. Now, what I'm suggesting here is a different way of framing the problem, a much more symmetrical way of framing the problem. I'm arguing that the experts, when they talk about risk, focus on hazard and ignore outrage. They therefore systematically overestimate the risk when the hazard is high and underestimate the risk when the hazard is low because all they're doing is looking at the hazard. Now the public, in precise parallel, focuses on outrage and ignores hazard. The public, therefore, overestimates the risk when the outrage is high and underestimates the risk when the outrage is low. What I'm arguing is that point two correlation I keep talking about, far from being the result of misperception or misunderstanding, is in fact the result of a definitional dispute. I'm arguing that point two is the genuine correlation 
between hazard and outrage, two nearly independent variables that have one interesting thing in common. They're both called risk by different groups of people. Now, as I look at your faces, some of you buy it, okay, and some of you don't. Okay. Let me tell you what some of you are thinking, particularly the engineers who raised their hands before. Some of you are thinking, okay, this is new terminology for old concepts. What Sandman is calling hazard is real risk, objective risk. What Sandman is calling outrage is subjective, social science, artsy-fartsy risk. Okay. Now, I can't keep you from thinking that, but I want to be very clear that I'm not saying that. Okay. And if, in fact, your standard of which of these two is real and which isn't, which is objective and which is subjective, is the normal standard of science, that is, replicability of measurement, we have better data on outrage than we do on hazard. For most of these risks, I can tell you to three decimal places what they do to people's opinions. You can't tell me to three decimal places what they do to people's bodies. Okay, so if we're going to get into a pissing match over which of these two is science, I am in grave danger of winning. Okay. But I'll cut you slack and I will concede that hazard is real and I won't dismiss dead bodies as, oh well, that's just hazard. Okay. But I want you to concede that outrage is real and not dismiss angry or frightened people as that's just outrage. Because the core of my message, the core of my argument, is that outrage is as real as hazard. It's as measurable as hazard. It's as manageable as hazard. It's as much a part of risk as hazard. And it's as much a part of your job as hazard. I'm going to argue that most of your industries and most of government agencies have done a pretty decent job of managing hazard. You can do better, you will do better, you need to do better, but a pretty decent job of managing hazard and a terrible job of managing outrage. And that's why you're in the trouble you're in. Okay. That's where we're going. Now, in the research literature, there are at least, I don't know, 28, 29 variables that show up as what I'm calling components of outrage. Okay, you won't see them in the literature as components of outrage, not unless I wrote the literature. Uh, they're in the literature as correlates of public misperception of risk. Okay, and, and I hope I'm in process of convincing you that that's the wrong way to see the problem. Okay, that if you see the problem as public misperception, the problem's going to get worse. Now, we don't have time for 28 or 29. Uh, I'm going to discuss today 12 that seem to me the dominant components of outrage. And then I have a B list of another eight that I will go through very quickly uh, toward the end of the presentation. The first one that we're going to talk about is the distinction between risks that are voluntary and risks that are coerced. What I want you to do is think for a minute about the distinction between, on the one hand, deciding to go on a skiing trip, and on the other hand, having somebody rouse you out of bed in the middle of the night, shanghai you to the top of a mountain, strap slippery sticks to the bottom of your feet, and push you down the mountain. Okay. Now, we don't usually think this way, but it's worth noticing the experience on the way down the mountain is exactly the same. Right? When sliding down a mountain is sliding down a mountain. Nonetheless, one of these is recreation, the other is assault with a deadly weapon. Okay? And we have no trouble telling the difference, right? If, if I decide you're going to slide down the mountain, that's assault. If you decide you're going to slide down the mountain, you're on holiday. Okay? Now that's true not just for skiing, but across a very wide range of risky behaviors. If the behavior is voluntary, it shows up in the literature as much as three orders of magnitude more acceptable than if it's coerced. I like saying things like three orders of magnitude. It makes me feel like I'm technical, too. Uh, for, for, for those of you from the Public Affairs Department, that's up to a 1,000 times as acceptable if it's voluntary as if it's coerced. That's a, that's a, a larger difference than you usually get in social science. Okay. And it's not just individual behavior. Okay. It's, it, it applies to community behaviors as well. Think, for example, about siting, siting of controversial facilities. Okay, and let's imagine two very different sighting scenarios. Okay. In scenario one, a company comes into town and it says, look, we'd like to put our dimethyl meatloaf factory here. 
Uh, we don't care whether you want it here or not. We own the land. We own the zoning board. We own the regulatory agencies. If you don't like it, you can move. Okay. Some of you are smiling like those were the good old days. <laughs> and a few of you are looking puzzled like, well, isn't that how it's done? Okay. Now, in scenario two, the company comes into town and it says, look, we'd like to put our dimethyl meatloaf factory here, but only if you want it here. So here's what we're going to do. We'd like to give you a small technical assistance grant so you can hire your own expert to advise you on what the risks and benefits really are. Okay. Then we want you to convene a negotiating team. And we'll talk. We'll talk about mitigation. We'll talk about compensation. Maybe you want us to bond for property values. Maybe you want stipulated penalties. So if something goes wrong, uh, you can sue us uh, without having to go to regulatory agencies. Whatever you want, we'll talk about. And if at the end of that negotiation we can agree on terms such that you now want us to build a facility and we still want to build it, we'll sign a contract and we'll build it. If we can't agree on terms, we won't build it. Guaranteed, in writing, in advance. Now some of you are looking like, why did we invite a communist to come speak? Okay. <laughs> And I understand that a voluntary citing might not work. Most of you understand that a coerced citing also might not work. It's hard to cite controversial facilities. One of the things that is guaranteed, though, is that under the second scenario, the public is going to consider dimethyl meatloaf a lot less risky than under the first scenario. Okay. That's guaranteed. The right to say no makes saying maybe a much smaller risk. And I mean that literally. This is not a metaphor. Okay? I, I, I mean it literally. Again, think about skiing. What does the skier say when a non-skier says, you're crazy, you're going to kill yourself, don't do it? Do skiers say, yeah, I know it's risky, but I really love it? I don't think so. Maybe if they work for EPA, they say that. Okay? Okay, but I, uh, most skiers will say, come on, it's not really risky. Right? What does that mean? Does that mean they don't know the hazard data? Uh-uh, they know the hazard data. They see the medical corpsman skiing down the mountain with fractured people. Okay? They know the hazard data. They still assert that skiing isn't risky. And the reason is very straightforward. Skiing is voluntary. Because it's voluntary, it generates no outrage. Okay? Because it generates no outrage, it is literally not very risky because outrage is most of what we mean by risk. However, it's extraordinarily hazardous. What do you do about that? Okay. If you're in a situation where outrage is high, what do you do? You try to find ways to make the risk more voluntary. Now, I say more voluntary because voluntary is not an on-off switch. It's not a dichotomy. How many of you are parents? Good. Lots of parents. Everyone who's ever raised a child knows that good parenting is finding a middle range between fascism and chaos. Okay. <laughs> And, and I, I'm in, in, in talking about parenting, I'm not suggesting that communities are children. I am suggesting that we already have a precedent in our lives for finding a middle on voluntariness. The second component I want to talk about is the distinction between risks that are natural and risks that are industrial. I think, I think you can think of a natural risk as kind of midway between a voluntary risk and a coerced risk. It's much more acceptable than a coerced risk. It's somewhat less acceptable than a voluntary risk. It's, it's kind of God's coercion. Okay? And we are all of us more forgiving of God than we are of multinational corporations. Okay? This is a distinction some of you may have trouble making. Okay? <laughs> but the public doesn't. Okay? And, and we cut slack for God in a way that we don't cut slack for agencies or corporations, presumably in the hope that God will eventually return the favor. So uh, a, a very good example of this, I think, is radon. Uh, in New Jersey, where I lived until very recently, according to our state DEP, 30% of the homes in North Jersey had enough radon in their basements to represent an excess lifetime lung cancer risk of somewhere between 1 in 100 and 3 in 100. 30% of the homes had enough radon. They're just living in their house all their lives, elevated people's cancer risk by 1 to 3%. Now, that's a huge risk. I mean, if you have anything on your desk that represents a cancer risk to the community of 1 in 10,000, you're talking about a serious hazard. 1 in 100,000 is, is, is worth regulating. We're moving toward 1 in a million. And I'm talking 1 in 100 to 3 in 100, and we can't get people to spend $20 on a charcoal canister to test. 
Now, if some corporation were going door to door, putting radon in people's basements, then we'd have no trouble getting them to test. But because it's God's radon, not a corporation's radon, because it's a natural risk, not an industrial risk, it generates enormously less outrage. In fact, in the only place in New Jersey where radon isn't natural, uh, some of you may know this story, there, there was, at the turn of the century, a luminescent paint factory. Uh, they, uh, they added radium to paints to make, the to make the paints glow in the dark. They don't do that anymore. Uh, and their slag was, of course, radium contaminated. Uh, it got used as landfill. Homes got built on top of it. Same problem as natural radon, or almost the same. A little different ratio of beta to gamma to, to alpha, but almost the same problem uh, as natural radon. Instead of coming from uranium in the rock and soil, it's coming from radium in the landfill. Okay. But now it's not God's radon anymore. It's some company's radon. And when the DEP, the State Department of Environmental Protection, dug several tens of thousands of barrels of this stuff up and tried to move it to another place, to another site, to Vernon, New Jersey, they precipitated the largest civil disobedience in New Jersey since the Vietnam War. Okay. I mean, people lying down or swearing, signing pledges that they would lie down in front of trucks sooner than let this radon-contaminated soil, radium-contaminated soil, come into their town notwithstanding the fact that the level of radiation in the average basement in Vernon is about the same as the level of radiation that would have been generated in the quarry where they were planning to dispose of the soil. Okay. And people knew that. People knew that. People went to hearings and they said, it's bad enough, I've got this crap in my basement. Okay. You're not going to move any more of it into my town. You know, graphic evidence of the difference between a natural and an industrial risk. What do you do about that? I could say, gee, try to make all the risks you impose on people natural, uh, but you can't. So what you have to do is remember that they're not natural and not seem to be pretending that they're natural. Okay? Uh, and the way this normally goes wrong is with risk comparisons. Uh, lots and lots of people, uh, experts, when they are trying, and I think in good faith, trying to explain to the public why the risk is not something to worry about, will use a comparison to a natural risk. If you're talking acute risk, it's usually getting hit by lightning on the golf course. Uh, if you're talking chronic risk, it's usually aflatoxin in peanut butter. How many of you have used or heard used comparisons of that sort? Okay, nearly all of you. Now, let me tell you how that sounds to citizens. It sounds like what you're saying is, if you think what we're doing to you is bad, check out what God is doing to you. And if you're not angry at God, you've got no right to be angry at us. Okay. And people walk away thinking, that company or that agency thinks they're God, okay. which may exacerbate a problem you have anyway. So the moral of the story is natural risk and industrial risk are judged on a different metric. Always will be. They should be. In hazard terms, they're not. But in outrage terms, they are and always will be. And therefore, any time you compare an industrial risk that you are responsible for with a natural risk that God is responsible for, trying to argue that yours isn't as bad as God's, the argument is going to backfire and outrage is going to increase. Number three is the distinction between risks that are familiar and risks that are exotic. I can use radon as an example of this one as well. Uh, radon, as most of you know, is a decay product of uranium in the soil, rises through the rock and soil. If it happens to hit the surface under your house, it rises into your basement where it concentrates and threatens you with lung cancer. Well, I stopped being afraid of my basement when I was five years old. Very hard to get people to take a risk seriously when it strikes as such, in such familiar turf as their own home. You know, my home is, 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 my, is my castle, is my sanctuary. We say safe as houses. Okay, it's, it's hard to take a risk seriously in your own house. Similarly, a lot of you know that inside manufacturing facilities, the biggest risk communication problem is excessive familiarity. Okay. That is to say, with workers, they, they, they are so familiar with the risks, the outrage goes down. Pretty soon, uh, uh, workers aren't taking the precautions seriously, that the uh, exposure rate is going up, the accident rate is going up, and that the dominant risk communication problem is to figure out how to keep people worried. Okay. Outside the factory, you're likely to have exactly the opposite problem. I don't know what's going out your stacks. I don't know what's in the flare. I don't know what's in all those barrels. I don't know what the funny smell is. The more things I don't know, 
the more outrage I'm going to experience. A beautiful example of this, I think, is the Superfund cleanup. There are occasionally Superfund cleanups. It's not real common, but it does happen. <laughs> and one, one of the things that we've noticed is just as the cleanup begins, or more properly, just as the remedial investigation begins, they're, they're about to reduce, they're, re, they're about to reduce the, the hazard. Okay? And almost invariably, the outrage goes through the roof. Okay? And, and the principal reason, I think, is familiarity. It was a familiar puddle of crud. Okay? Unattractive, but familiar. Hey, I'll meet you by the lagoon. Okay? And, 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 and suddenly it goes high tech. There's a, there's a trailer camp of consultants. They're sinking high pressure injection wells. They're bringing a rotary kiln incinerator to the site. People walking around in moon suits. I mean, talk about double messages. Did you ever have anybody knock on your door in a moon suit? <laughs> Just testing your drinking water, nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Well, all that high-tech paraphernalia it increases the outrage enormously. Okay, so just, just as the hazard's about to go down, because a familiar risk becomes an exotic risk, the outrage goes up. And the solution is very obvious, given this diagnosis. The solution is very straightforward. It's make the risk more familiar. Okay, it's displays in shopping malls, it's K through 12 education uh, curriculum materials, it's plant tours. Uh, for the Superfund example, have a little media event the week before the cleanup starts in front of City Hall where you let kids walk around in the moon suits. Okay? You demythologize the technology, you demythologize the risk, you make people familiar with the risk. Now notice I'm not saying make people familiar with the benefits. Oftentimes, uh, companies in particular think, if only people understood how wonderful this product is, how good it is for the society, then things would be much better. And that's sometimes useful, but it's not nearly as useful as companies imagine. What we're talking about when we talk about familiarity is exactly the opposite of the intuition, the instinct of a lot of corporate folks and, and I think a lot of government folks as well. Okay? Your instinct is, gee, we want to reassure people, we better not tell them anything about the risk. We better not tell them anything scary if we're trying to reassure them. Okay? And it turns out, that sounds like it ought to make sense, but it turns out it usually works the other way. Okay? Because you're not telling us, because we're not familiar with the risks, instead of being reassured, we are very alarmed. We are alarmed by what we don't understand. Most of us can see this if we, if we go outside our own field. Uh, imagine, for example, uh, I don't know, imagine the issue of accidental nuclear war. And let's look at two different Pentagon speeches on accidental nuclear war. Okay? In, in speech one, uh, the Pentagon says, oh, we never worry about accidental nuclear war. Couldn't happen. You know, it's a figment of Peacenik's imagination. Okay? In speech two, the Pentagon says, oh, yeah, accidental nuclear war, we worry a lot about that. We've got a whole division that goes to bed every night, get up, gets up every morning, trying to figure out ever more sophisticated ways to make sure we'll never have an accidental nuclear war. We think we're doing a good job. We think we've, we've got the problem under control, but we never give up. We take that problem very seriously. Which speech is more reassuring? The second one. Which speech usually gets given? The first one. So the goal is to make us familiar with the risks, level with us about the risks, so they lose some of that capacity to provoke outrage. Number four is the distinction between risks that are memorable and risks that are not memorable. Uh, and the list says not memorable because in each case I want to look at the safe side of the dichotomy, the safe side of the scale, and the safe side of this one is not memorable. What does memorability mean? Memorability is kind of the flip side of familiarity. If familiarity is to what extent have you lived with the risky situation without anything going wrong, memorability is how easy is it for you to envision something going wrong. Okay. Now, the source of memorability, of course, is personal experience. I mean, people who live through floods take floods more seriously. But it doesn't require personal experience. A real good replacement for personal experience, when we look at the memorability of a risk, is the media, especially television. I've never been to Bhopal, I've never been to Chernobyl, but I learned from television and, and to a lesser extent from newspapers about the risks of nuclear power and the risks of chemical manufacturing from those two events. Okay. It doesn't have to be news. I do a lot of work with, uh, with the biotechnology industry and the memorability of biotechnology risks comes mostly from fiction. 
It's all those bad movies we saw when we were 13. The gene that ate Chicago. <laughs> I'm not saying the risk is fiction. I don't know whether the risk is fiction or not, but its memorability comes very largely from fiction. Okay. Similarly, symbol value has a lot to do with memorability. Uh, most of you probably remember the ALAR controversy a few years ago, uh, an additive in apples that uh, uh, helps them stay on the, on the tree longer. Um, well, a lot of the memorability of that battle came from the apple as a symbol of innocence and the poisoned apple as a symbol of the betrayal of innocence, starting with Adam and Eve, working our way through to Snow White and on to the latest corporate takeover. We have vivid imagery of the poisoned apple. Okay. Now, every cartoonist in the country used that to talk about ALAR, but that's not the point. The point is that every psyche in the country was primed for it, was ready for it. Imagine, if you will, that ALAR, instead of being an additive on apples, was something you put in pork. Okay. Now, I think the Natural Resources Defense Council would have been too smart to go after an additive in pork, but suppose they had. The media would not have been very interested. The public would not have been very interested. Why? Nobody has any vision of pork getting any dirtier than it already is. <laughs> but apples, apples. Now, now think about that when you think of two bioengineered food products on their way to market, bioengineered pork and bioengineered milk. Okay? If there's any food with more symbolic freight than the apple, it's milk. If pork gets to market first, I would predict it'll sail right through. If milk gets to market first, there will be hell to pay okay, because of the memorability. Okay, so whether, whether we're talking uh, fiction or we're talking news or we're talking symbol or we're talking personal experience, the more memorable the risk is, the more outrage it's going to generate. What can you do about that? Yeah, I, I could advise you to avoid memorable accidents but you probably don't need me to advise you to avoid memorable accidents. Where, where it's less obvious, I think, is the need to acknowledge the sources of memorability that are already there. I mean, try, try to imagine, I don't know, Richard Nixon talking about his presidency without mentioning Watergate. Okay, or uh, Exxon talking about its environmental record without mentioning Valdez. Okay. And the audience is sitting there waiting to see if the spokesperson is going to mention Valdez. And until they talk about Valdez, you're only half listening, right? The other half of you is waiting to see how they will handle this obviously important issue. Okay. So the moral of the story is if you're Exxon, you talk about Valdez early. You know, you go out there to give your environmental message and you start as the company that brought you Valdez. Boy, are we thinking about the environment now. Whatever it is that's making the risk memorable, whether it's technically relevant or not, talk about it early, voluntarily. Okay? We're waiting to hear about it. Number five is the distinction between risks that are dreaded and risks that are not dreaded. Uh, and here again, I'm writing not dreaded because that's the safe side of the continuum. Now, I, I think you have to be a Jungian psychologist to know what dread means. Uh, and I'm not, but we all know the outcomes. What's the most dread disease in America today? AIDS, AIDS and what's number two? Cancer. Okay, now, uh, I'm a specialist in environmental risk, and as far as I know, uh, none of, nothing that my clients work on causes AIDS, although further research is needed. Okay. Uh, but cancer is obviously a biggie, and you all know that the same amount of mortality, if it's attributable to cancer, is going to generate more public concern, more regulatory action, more media coverage than that amount of mortality attributed to some less dreaded disease like asthma or emphysema. Okay. Similarly, we have a powerful dread response to radiation. You talk about radiation and even radiologists cross their legs. <laughs> and, and, an even, and an even more powerful dread response, I think, to waste. You don't have to be a very sophisticated observer of discussions of hazardous waste to notice that they're more about the noun than the adjective. You put a 55-gallon uh, drum of, of, of uh, hazardous raw materials in front of a plant, and people are moderately upset, okay, moderately concerned. You move that drum through the plant and out the back door and call it hazardous waste, and people go nuts. Okay. I mean, sometime when you're, when you're watching a discussion of hazardous waste, turn off the sound on the television and watch people's, people's noses wrinkle. Okay, the classic nonverbal communication of disgust, okay, a very close cousin of dread. 
or turn the sound back up and count the number of times people use the rhetoric of control. We have to control the waste stream. Does this remind you of some key event in your life at about the age of two? <laughs> now, now, I can't prove that discussions of hazardous waste are all about toilet training. Okay? And even if they are, that doesn't mean the issue is a lot of BS. Okay? But, but, but it does tell us something important diagnostically. It tells us that the dread is coming more from the fact that it's waste than from the fact that it's hazardous. Okay. What do we do about dread? Very much the same thing as we do about memorability. The thing to do with dread is to legitimate it, to get it on the table. A very, very good example of that in New Jersey a few summers back. Uh, some of you may remember it. Uh, it was medical waste floating up on the shore. Okay. And, uh, and the public looked at this, you know, syringes and whatnot uh, floating up on the shore, and the public said, ugh, that's disgusting. The state DEP said, it's not hazardous. And the public said, that's disgusting. And the DEP said, it's not hazardous. Now, what the DEP desperately needed to say is, that's disgusting, but it's not hazardous. Okay. Now, in Rhode Island, they did that. The issue came to uh, the, the Health Commission rather than the Health Department, rather than the Environmental Protection Department, and uh, Denny Scott, the Commissioner of Health, got on television and he said something like this. He said, the people of Rhode Island will not and should not tolerate medical waste floating up on our shore. It's true that the risk to human health is essentially zero. Nonetheless, it's disgusting. It's unacceptable. And the health department will do whatever it takes to put a stop to it. And you know what the public's response was? Wait a minute. If it's not really a threat to health, how much are you going to spend? <laughs> and New Jersey would have killed for that response. Okay? And Rhode Island got it simply by legitimating the dread. By, 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 by legitimating the dread, by taking the dread seriously, Rhode Island enabled the public to get past the dread. By ignoring it, New Jersey left the public stuck in it. Number six is the distinction between risks that are chronic and risks that are catastrophic. Okay? Or, or as this is often thought of, risks that are diffuse in time and space versus risks that are concentrated in time and space. Okay? And I suspect most of you know uh, what's coming here. All things being equal, and all things aren't always equal, but all things being equal, the public is much more concerned about catastrophe than it is about chronic risk. Okay? The same amount of mortality okay, is going to generate a whole lot more outrage if it comes in great big clumps than if it comes one at a time spread out over space and time. Wonderful example of this is smoking. Smoking kills in the United States about 350,000 people a year. Okay. Imagine that they all had to die on November 13th in Chicago. Okay. On November 14th, we would outlaw smoking. We would not allow 350,000 people to die, even in Chicago, without immediately <laughs> taking action. Okay. But that's not what happens, right? They die spread out over the year, spread out over the country in the privacy of their pain, and that's much more acceptable. Not just to other people, not just to peculiar citizens who don't have a technical education, but in fact to all of us. And let, let me try and prove that to you. Uh, let, let's look at two scenarios. We'll make them power generation scenarios. In scenario one, uh, it might be, say, solar power. Okay? And I'm making up these data. Let's say solar power kills 50 people a year. They die falling off their roof one at a time, spread out over the year, while installing or repairing their solar installation. Okay? And again, I'm making up the numbers. Okay. Meanwhile, the second power generation uh, technology might be some kind of power plant. Let's assume that it has one chance in 10 of wiping out a nearby community of 5,000 people sometime in the next decade. Okay, risk assessors, one chance in 10 over a 10-year period of killing 5,000 people. What's the expected annual mortality? 50, same as solar power. Now, is there any doubt in anybody's mind that our society will accept a technology that kills 50 people a year spread out and would not for a moment allow the sword of Damocles to hang over a community of 5,000 with anything like one chance in 10 of wiping them out sometime in the next 10 years? 
That's not because we're stupid. It's not because we don't understand the numbers. It's not because we can't multiply because we can't calculate. It's because we have and we share with you and with everyone else a value that tells us that catastrophe is more serious than chronic risk. The same number of deaths when they come all together disturb the universe more. Okay? And they disturb our psyches more. What does that mean? It means you have to take uh, acute risk. You have to take uh, uh, worst-case scenarios much more seriously. The low probability, high magnitude risk deserves more attention than it gets given a quantitative calculation of expected annual mortality. Uh, it also means that more attention to reducing magnitude would be useful. Uh, that is, when the public looks at the high magnitude, low probability risk, it is looking mostly at the magnitude. It's looking at how many people might die. And reducing that number, addressing that number, taking that number seriously is terribly important. You can't say to people, it's true, we might end the universe, but it's highly unlikely. The seventh factor I want to talk about is the distinction between risks that are knowable and risks that are not knowable. This is really several factors taken together. Part of knowability is uncertainty. Okay. Uh, what, what, how, how uncertain is the risk? How, how large is the error bar? Now, that's, that's a factor, interestingly enough, that the public takes much more seriously than the experts. If you look at two risks here, let's create two risks. The right side is the dangerous side. Okay? The first risk is pretty dangerous, but it's pretty well understood. The error bar is small. The second rich risk is probably safer. The second risk is probably safer, but the error bar is much larger. Less, less is known about it. Now, when the experts look at these two risks, they're going to say, well, the second one is obviously a better bet because probably things aren't going to go wrong as much. Things aren't as bad. The, the experts, in other words, are going to compare this point with this point. The public does something very different. The public looks at the size of these two error bars and compares the worst case scenarios, compares this point with this point and says, aha, this is the safer risk. And the public may be right. It turns out that worst case scenarios happen a whole lot more often than they're supposed to happen according to the confidence limits. Uh, so the public may have some wisdom there. But whether it's wise or not, what the public is doing is worrying a whole lot more about uncertainty than the experts are. Now, even worse than uncertainty as a component of knowability is expert disagreement, what Lois Gibbs calls dueling PhDs. <laughs> I think you know exactly what I mean. One expert says, I eat it for breakfast, uh, and the other side's expert says, even thinking about it will give you cancer. And, and, and the public's response to that kind of, of, of expert disagreement is extraordinarily conservative, extraordinarily cautious. Uh, they did a wonderful study at Carnegie Mellon, uh, and the example they used was EMF, power transmission lines. And one bunch of people read a news story, a hypothetical news story, in which all the experts quoted said power transmission lines were pretty dangerous, say seven on a hypothetical 10-point scale. Another bunch of people read a news story where half the experts said it was seven and half the experts said it was three. Okay, half the experts were much less alarmed. The second story was more scary than the first story. Now, if you think about that for a minute, it's not so strange. If all the experts say it's seven, it's probably seven. If half the experts say it's seven and half the experts say it's three, obviously they don't know what they're doing. It might be 14. Okay? <laughs> Another piece, I think, of, of this issue of knowability is detectability. Um, I was at Three Mile Island, and uh, some of you may know, there's kind of a disaster beat among reporters. So reporters at Three Mile Island were hugging each other, saying, gee, I haven't seen you since Jonestown. Uh, <laughs> fairly thick-skinned people, okay? But, but they were frightened at Three Mile Island. It's the only time I've ever seen a room full of reporters rush a press secretary and demand to be moved further from the story. Okay, which is not usually what reporters want. Uh, and I asked a reporter who'd been through wars and hurricanes and all kinds of risky situations, I said, why are you scared here? And his answer, I think, was very revealing. He said, look, at least in a war, you know you haven't been hit yet. Okay. Eloquent testimony to the undetectability of radiation in particular, but of carcinogens in general. Okay. And in fact, you'll never know whether you've been hit. Even after the latency is over and you get your cancer, it doesn't come with a tag that tells you where you got it. 
Okay. So whether we're talking about uh, uncertainty or we're talking about undetectability or we're talking about expert disagreement, all of those are going to contribute to the knowability problem. And that, of course, in turn is going to contribute to the outrage. Now, what can you do about unknowability? Okay. Sometimes you can make the risk more knowable. Wonderful example of that was an incinerator controversy in Japan. Uh, the big issue with incinerators, of course, is temperature. You want them to burn hot enough so that they'll burn completely. Uh, and that was an issue in this particular Japanese community. And the resolution of the battle was a seven-foot neon sign on the roof of the incinerator hooked to the temperature gauge. So if a citizen wanted to know if it was burning hot enough, all she had to do was look out the window and look. Okay. Now, I happen to think that sign reduced the hazard, okay, because I think engineers exceed tech specs less often when they do it on a seven-foot neon sign. <laughs> but whether it reduced the hazard or not, clearly it reduced the outrage, because citizens could find out for themselves whether the incinerator was operating correctly, Okay, because the risk became more detectable, that made it more knowable, that made it less a source of outrage, and that made it literally less of a risk. Similarly, when you look at uncertainty and expert disagreement, the worst one of the two is, of course, expert disagreement. Uncertainty is bad enough, expert disagreement is worse. You can often convert expert disagreement into uncertainty simply by reporting a range. And look at a typical risk controversy. Along comes a company and it says, the risk from this contamination is uh, uh, 10 to the minus 8. And along comes EPA and it says, no, uh, that's not a conservative enough calculation. We calculated it at 10 to the minus 7. And then Greenpeace sticks its oar in and it says, no, you're both lying through your teeth. It's actually 10 to the minus 6. And people listen to that fight, is it 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 6, and, and gets a strong impression that the experts don't know what they're doing, that the risk is extremely uncertain and therefore extremely serious. Now imagine if instead of reporting 10 to the minus 8, the company were to say something like this. Well, we think the risk is 10 to the minus 8, but we've talked to EPA and they think it's 10 to the minus 7. We've even talked to Greenpeace, they think it's 10 to the minus 6. It's somewhere in there, 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8. Now, if you're a risk assessor or if you're an attorney, the idea of, of playing fast and loose that way with two orders of magnitude sends a frisson of terror down your spine. Okay? And, and I understand that. But in communication terms, reporting a range takes most of the outrage out of the situation. Okay, number eight is the distinction between risks that are controlled by the individual and risks that are controlled by the society. I like this one. This is a neat one. Okay. It's, it's like, control is like voluntariness, but it's different. Voluntariness is who decides. Control is who implements. Uh, if, for example, your spouse asks you to go to the store and pick up some groceries, the trip to the store is not voluntary. Okay. Not in most households, anyhow. Uh, but you're still in control because you're driving. Driving is, in fact, a good example. Raise your hand if you feel safer behind the wheel than in the passenger seat. Okay, nearly all the hands are up, and that's consistent with the data. 85% of the American public consider themselves better than average drivers. <laughs> and the other 15% are right. Okay. Now, now, that's a sizable, optimistic bias hooked to control. Okay, it's, not, it's not just driving across a very wide range of risky behaviors. If I am in control, I feel much safer, and if you are in control, I feel less safe. Now, Chauncey Starr, who used to do this kind of research for the electric power industry, has a metaphor for control that's wonderful. And I think once you hear it, you'll never forget the importance of control. What I want you to do is imagine yourself slicing a rib roast. Okay. If anyone here is a vegetarian, you can imagine slicing a large piece of tofu. Okay. That'll work too. And this is an informal occasion. You have no fork. Okay. So one hand is right on the meat, and the other hand is carving. And I want you to get a kinesthetic vision, a real picture in your head of how close to the knife the hand on the meat is as you cut. Really picture it. Okay, you got it? Now, let's make it a two-person job. <laughs> Give somebody else the knife. What happens to the hand on the meat? Okay. Pulls way back, right? Either that or you get a fork. 
Okay. Now, now, that's universal, so risk assessors try to make sense out of it. They say, well, the feedback loop is more complex with two cerebrums than with one cerebrum, okay, which is their quaint way of saying that it takes less time to quit cutting than it does to say, that's my finger. <laughs> And that's true. Okay, but we intuitively know that's not why our hand pulls back, right? We don't think, oh dear, the feedback loop just got more complex. Okay. The, reason, the reason our hand pulls back is most of us feel as long as we've got the knife, the risk to neighborhood fingers is quite low. Okay. And if somebody else has the knife, the risk to, neighbor, to neighborhood fingers has just gone way up. Now, that's true even if you give the knife to your spouse or your neighbor, to somebody you like. Now, imagine giving the knife to a multinational corporation. Okay. Imagine giving the knife to a faceless bureaucratic regulatory agency. In most risk controversies between communities and companies or between communities and agencies, the company or the agency is holding the knife. The community is holding the meat. Okay. The community, in fact, feels it is the meat. Okay. And the company or agency isn't just holding the knife, it's waving it around like a chef in a Japanese restaurant saying, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. And it is if you've got the knife. Okay? But it's a lot less safe if you've got the meat. Now, I think all of these are important. But control is so important that it's almost a contradiction to do what institutions so often try to do in risk controversies. I mean, so typically, you've got two messages to the public in a risk controversy. Your first message is, get your hands off my knife. Okay? It's my company or it's my agency. We're in charge here. We've got the expertise. We've got the mandate. We own the land. Get out. Butt out. Don't bother us. And the second message is, don't worry. Very hard to hear that second message through the outrage generated by the first. It's very hard to simultaneously disempower people and reassure them. Okay. So the reassuring message gets lost. Now, what to do about it is very straightforward. And we can all think of ways to reduce that feeling of you're in control, I'm not in control. Basically, we're talking about sharing the knife. We're talking about community advisory boards. Uh, if you look at Sarah Title III, we're look, talking about powerful local emergency planning committees. We're talking about negotiation with environmentalists. Uh, maybe we're talking the Valdez principles, environmentalists on your board, uh, uh, public environmental audits from, from outside auditors. It's not hard to think of ways of sharing control. The problem is that it's hard to want to share control. Nobody wants to share control. I mean, I, I'm a college professor. We don't share control with students unless we have to. Uh, Nobody likes sharing control. I, I gave this speech a few years ago to the board of directors of the Chemical Manufacturers Association. You know, 40 chemical company CEOs in golf clothes. Okay. And, and they were very nice and very responsive uh, until I got to power sharing, until I got to control. And I thought somebody was going to have a coronary. Okay. I mean, these are CEOs. They don't share control with executive vice presidents. They have pissed in the four corners of the company and it's theirs. Okay. And if you think they're bad, talk to an audience of regulators. I mean, at least, at least with a company, you can say, if you share control, you might make more money, and companies like money. Okay? Government agencies aren't allowed to make money. They go to jail if they make money. Okay? And all they've got is power. Okay? And if they share it, they've got less. And over their dead body, they're going to share control. Okay? But, but the data are very clear. Okay? That it's almost a contradiction, it's almost impossible to hold on to the control, to disempower people, and simultaneously to try to reassure them. So finding ways that you can live with to share the power is enormously important in beginning to reduce the outrage. Number nine is the distinction between risks that are fair and risks that are unfair. Now, we've already talked about this a good deal when we talked about voluntariness, because obviously a voluntary risk is going to be fairer than a coerced risk. But that's not the only component of fairness that matters. Okay. Another one that matters a whole lot, uh, it seems to me, is the distribution of risk versus the distribution of benefit. Now, companies are all the time going out to the public and saying, hey, the benefits outweigh the risks. And they're usually right. The benefits usually, usually do outweigh the risks. But that claim turns out to be pretty irrelevant if, as so often happens, the benefits are going different places than the risks. 
Look, for example, at a manufacturing facility. Okay. Unless your stacks are awfully tall, the risks, whether they're large or small, are concentrated in the immediate vicinity of the plant gates. Okay. They may be big, they may be little, but they're right around in a donut around the plant gates. Unless your demographics are very weird, the benefits are not similarly concentrated. People who live near major manufacturing facilities tend to be lower in income, lower in socioeconomic status. They are more likely to be members of racial minorities. They are more likely to be victims of a wide range of environmental insults and social pathologies than the people who live further away. Okay. So when, a, when a, a company official goes into such a community and says, hey, the benefits outweigh the risks, he or she is right. And when the community says back, yeah, benefits for you and risks for us, the community's right. And, and, and what's important to remember here is that accurate perception from the community that the risk is not fairly distributed makes the risk a large outrage. And that makes the risk a large risk. So I am arguing that an unfair risk is by definition a big risk okay, because it's a big outrage. Okay. What do you do about that? Well, you share the benefits in proportion to the risks. But that's a problem. You can't really go into a community and say the bad news is we're going to give you cancer, the good news is we're going to build your park. Okay? Because people will feel bribed, won't they? Okay? And they'll take the, uh, the quality of the park as a good measure of how much cancer you're bringing. Okay? And, and, and the strategy will backfire. So what you wind up having to do is yoke control and fairness. Bracket those two together uh, and, and go to the community and say, look, to the extent that we can reduce the risk, we will and we should and we must. To the extent that we can't reduce the risk, we are obliged to compensate you for it. What do you want? And at the point at which the community says, give us a park, okay, at that point, the community no longer feels bribed. Now, the company at that point or the agency at that point may feel blackmailed. And, I, and, and I'm sensitive to the fact that outrage is a two-way street and, and feeling blackmailed isn't a nice feeling, but I have to tell you it's a good sign. Okay? You know, when, when you are feeling blackmailed instead of them feeling bribed, that suggests that the power has been redistributed more equally and the fairness is being redistributed more equally and you're well on your way to reduced outrage. Number 10 is the distinction between risks that are morally relevant and risks that are morally irrelevant. And I, I've written down morally irrelevant here because that's the safe side of this particular factor. Okay. Uh, moral relevance is a little hard to grasp at first hand. Let me see if I can make sense out of it. Over the last 25 years, our society has convinced ourselves that pollution is evil. It's wrong. It's unethical. It's immoral. Now, that's a paradigm shift. That's a terribly important change in social values. It's something to be proud of. It's like deciding cannibalism is wrong, independent of the quality of the protein. <laughs> Slavery is wrong, whether or not it's a good way to grow cotton. Okay? And we've similarly decided that pollution is wrong, and we've separated that moral judgment from the instrumental calculation of how much harm is being done. That's good. That's something to be proud of, but it brings a problem with it. Okay? And the problem it brings is once you've decided something is morally relevant, it's not just a matter of harm, but it's a matter of morality, the language of trade-offs becomes unusable. Okay? Trade-offs of risk against benefit, trade-offs of risk against cost is the only rational way to talk about hazard. It is an unacceptable, immoral, callous way to talk about outrage. Let me see if I can make that clear. Let's think about child molesting. Now, somewhere in the police department, formally or informally, in order to allocate the budget, they do a cost-risk trade-off analysis on child molesting. Okay, does everybody agree? You can't allocate a budget without either, either on paper or, or, or casually looking at the trade-offs, how much money you can spend to reduce the number of molested children by how many children. They do that. But the chief of police never goes on television and announces, ladies and gentlemen, the optimal number of molested children for 1991 is 17. How does that sound? The optimal number of molested children. Ugh. What's the optimal number of molested children? Zero. Does that mean we fire the chief of police if any child gets molested? No. Does it mean we expect him to spend the whole budget on child molesting? 
No, we know perfectly well there are other priorities. We know perfectly well the budget has to get allocated and that some children we will be molested. We nonetheless demand, and we mean it, this isn't hypocrisy, we demand that the chief of police endorse our moral value that no molested child is acceptable. Far less optimal. Okay. He doesn't have to get to zero. He has to want to. He has to try to. He has to see his failure to get to zero as a grave moral failure, as a tragedy, as a problem. Okay. Now, in the pollution field, we haven't learned that lesson. The chief of police has, and it seems to me people responsible for environmental risk haven't. So companies are all the time going on television and saying something like this. And remember, the company is not the chief of police. It's the child molester. Okay? And it goes on TV, and it says, last year, we molested 19 children. Next year, we plan to molest 13 children. We're very proud of that record. <laughs> And it would be unconscionable to expect us to molest any fewer than 13 children. Just wouldn't be cost effective. Okay. And then you kind of sit back and you wait for the Civic Virtue Awards to come rolling in. Okay. And, and, and you're genuinely bewildered when they don't. Okay. And the solution is very straightforward. It's, it's, it's accept the moral relevance of pollution and therefore accept that the only proper goal is zero. Now, I have to tell you, I think you'll get a lot closer to zero when you accept it as a goal than when you reject it as a goal, but that's a hazard issue, and we can leave that aside for the moment. The point I want to focus on now is in accepting it as a goal, you, you take seriously the moral value. Like the police chief, you don't have to get to zero. Like the police chief, you have to want to. It's the smugness with which you say anyone who thinks that we can have zero pollution is nuts. It's the smugness of that answer that makes people so angry. Do police chiefs do not walk around saying anyone who thinks we can have zero molested children is nuts. Okay? They start every year wanting zero molested children and every year they fail and that's what you've got to do too. Number 11 is the distinction between sources who are trusted and maybe trustworthy versus sources who are not trusted and perhaps not trustworthy. Now, the first 10 were characteristics of the risk itself. Now we're moving into characteristics of the people who bring you the risk or who urge you to accept the risk. Now, I assume it comes as no surprise to this audience that industry today is not widely trusted. Okay? And that the industries that are most responsible for bringing us pollution, the chemical industry, the nuclear power industry, the uh, petroleum industry, the waste disposal industry, they are right down there at the bottom of the trust list along with the mafia. Some would say that's a redundant list. Okay? Uh, and the rest of industry is not far higher. And for that matter, government is not far higher. Trust in regulatory agencies is asymmetrical. When a regulatory agency uh, uh, warns people, it is highly trusted. When an agency says, don't drink the water, people trust you. They may drink the water anyhow, but they, they believe you. When you say, go ahead and drink the water, nobody believes you. Okay? What that means to most people is you haven't decided yet to admit that we can't drink the water. So, so, you know, whether we're looking at industry or we're looking at government, trust is, is, is low, distrust is widespread. Large numbers of people believe that manufacturing industries in the United States and, and in Western Europe and in much of the world are capable of endangering our health, endangering our environment, and lying to us about it. And that government is either <laughs> unable or unwilling to stop them. Okay. Now, I happen to think that's an accurate analysis. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, the history of, uh, of health and environment in this country has adequate evidence that, in fact, companies have been uh, unwilling to protect us and unwilling to level with us, and that agencies have been unable or unwilling to stop them. Uh, but we don't have to agree on that. Okay? We really don't have to agree on, uh, you know, many of you may think it's a bum rap and the environmental protection record and health protection record of industry and government are superb. What we have to agree on is that lots of people share my sense that industry and government can't be trusted. Okay. And that has two important implications. Okay. The obvious implication is over the long haul, you're going to need to learn how to get trusted. You're going to have to build trust. That's very hard. It's not easy. It's a lot easier to lose trust than it is to build trust. And over the long haul, that's got to happen. That's the long-term implication. 
The short-term implication is less obvious, and I think it's more important. Okay. Given that you're not trusted, given that trust is a slender reed, and when you lean on it, it breaks, you need to stop asking to be trusted. I mean, it is, there's, a, there's a paradox about trust. The more you ask to be trusted, the less we trust you. I mean, this is so clear that the stereotype in our society of, 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 of the sleazy, untrustworthy person, I don't know, the, the used car salesman, what does he say? Trust me. Right? You ask us to trust you, we check our wallet, we check our, our, our neighborhood for leukemia, we check our endangered species list to see what's missing, uh, and we notch the outrage up another couple of notches. You can't afford to ask to be trusted. It backfires. So what do you ask instead? It seems to me, instead of trust, the bottom line is accountability. And many, many of the accountability mechanisms, I think, are very much like the control mechanisms I talked about when I talked about sharing power, sharing control. We're talking about community advisory boards. We're talking about... Um, uh, in negotiation with environmentalists, we're talking about powerful LEPCs, other institutions so that you can assert, and this is true whether you're government, whether you're industry, whatever, wh wherever your role is, so that you can reliably assert to a public that isn't likely to trust you, hey, you don't have to trust us. They're looking over our shoulder. They're looking over our shoulder. They're looking over our shoulder. Don't trust us. You don't have to. And the irony, again, is the more you say that, the less you ask to be trusted, the more likely we are, in fact, to trust you. Now, it's not, it's, the problem is not thinking of accountability mechanisms. We can do that. The problem is deciding that you, in fact, want to be accountable. Nobody likes the feeling that they can't be trusted. We all feel we can be trusted. We know ourselves to be honorable people, and I am confident that you are honorable people, and we feel we can be trusted. So we have great difficulty thinking in terms of how do I make this accountable. And any number of companies in the last several years have developed strategies for reducing their effluent, and reducing it substantially, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. Most of them have not developed strategies for proving that they've done that. So what's going to happen? Along comes the XYZ Corporation, and it says, we've reduced our, our SAR Title III effluent by 80%. And the community, or some community group, says, prove it. And the XYZ Corporation says, well, yeah, here's the chart. Here's our graph. See how it goes down. That's the proof. And the community, or the community group, says, well, I don't believe your chart. You cooked the data. How can, how can I believe your chart? And you know what the company's response is? Nothing. What do you mean you don't believe my chart? You know, I'm, an, I'm an accredited engineer. You know, we're a multinational corporation. They don't lie. Okay. You know, to which the public's response is, yeah, sell me a bridge. Okay. Okay. So, so, I mean, I, I think these companies are setting themselves up. They're doing wonderful things, they think, they claim, and I believe them, but no one else is going to believe them. Okay? And it's not hard and it's not expensive to make those improvements accountable. I mean, think, think about, I don't know, think about a test, a, a well study. You're going you're gonna to study, sample a well and find out where, you know, how much carcinogen is there. Okay? Very often, you know before you start that when you come up with the results, people are going to say, I don't believe your results. Okay? They're going to say, you sampled in the wrong place. You know, you sampled too high, too low, over here, over there. You didn't sample in this backyard. You didn't sample there. You sent it to a lab that can't be trusted. And, and anyhow, you people lie through your teeth. How should I, why should I trust any of your numbers? Okay. Well, that's not hard to solve. You know, you, you, you don't do the sample until you've solved that. You bring in community people, not, not trusting community people, but untrusting community people, the people you least want to see, the people, the people you keep hoping you'll never see again are the ones you invite in. Okay? And you bring them in and you say, okay, let's work out now a sampling strategy that'll work. Okay? And I mean, if trust is very low, that may mean split half, it may mean double blind, it may mean the kinds of things medical researchers do. You take six samples, I'll take six samples, and we'll send six to this lab, and we'll send six to that lab, and we won't know which lab got whose samples, and we'll get back all 12 samples, and we'll look at them, and we agree in advance with dummy tables. If the results look like this, it's serious. If the results look like this, no problem. If the results in, are in the middle over here, we'll agree that it's ambiguous and we're not sure whether it's a problem or not. And you do that all before you do your study, before you do your tests. 
And when you're all done, it may, it may take a year, it may take a long time, but when you're done, instead of a test that you know in your heart, whatever it finds, nobody's going to buy it. Okay? You've got a test that people have got to buy. They helped you do it. Number 12 is a distinction between what I'm going to call responsive process and unresponsive process. This is the California variable. Uh, and I could take a whole hour to talk about responsive process, but we don't have an hour. Uh, so let me, let me list just three of the most important components of, of process, of responsiveness. Okay. And one of them uh, that's very important, I think, is the distinction between institutions that tell unpleasant truths proactively versus institutions that keep secrets, that, that withhold that information until it's finally revealed by a Freedom of Information Act complaint or a whistleblower or, 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 or some other unfortunate event. Okay. Now, as a society, we are very intolerant of secrets. Okay. Yeah. We can take bad news. We can't handle bad news kept secret. Where there are Sarah Title III battles in the United States today, they are mostly not fueled by how large the numbers are. They are fueled by how outraged people are that the numbers were kept secret for so long. How could you have that kind of effluent year after year and not tell us? Basically, I mean, with respect to secrecy, the bottom line is very straightforward. Either you're willing to bet your life that no one will ever find out, or you're willing to bet your life that when they find out, no one will mind that you didn't tell them earlier. Okay. And if you're not willing to bet one or the other of those, you've got to tell them now. Even if it hasn't been quality controlled. Even if you haven't got a three-volume management report ready on how you're going to solve the problem. Even if your boss says, oh, dear, I don't think we should talk about this. Even if your lawyer says, hey, it's going to raise liability problems. Uh, I mean, all those are good reasons. I'm not suggesting they're bad reasons. Uh, and so is sort of the, the, that old favorite, the public will be unnecessarily frightened. Those are all good reasons, but they're not good enough because the outrage that results from keeping secrets is huge. Another piece of responsive process is the distinction between apologizing for misbehavior and not apologizing for misbehavior. Just as we are a society that's, that's, uh, uh, that's unforgiving of secrets, okay, we are as a society very forgiving of the repentant sinner, but not of the unrepentant sinner, not of the weasel. And it's very important to understand that. I mean, what Exxon did wrong at Valdez, okay, far worse in my judgment than what it did to Prince William Sound, which seems to be in process of repairing itself, was, was Exxon's complete inability to, to apologize. To credibly say, I mean, they tried to apologize. They, they took out ads in the hundreds of newspapers that were supposed to be their apology, and the ad started, a terrible thing happened to Exxon in Prince William Sound. Okay, somehow, somehow, you know, the words, we're sorry, we did a terrible thing, couldn't pass the corporate lips. Okay, and they're paying for that. They're paying very heavily for that. The experts on apologizing and on forgiveness in our society are the Catholic Church, uh, I am not a Catholic, but my understanding is there are five steps to forgiveness. First, you admit that you did it. Second, you say you're sorry. Third, you try to make whole those who were damaged by your doing it. You try, you try to compensate. You try to do something uh, for the people you did harm to. Fourth, you promise never to do it again, or the church being reasonable, you promise to try never to do it again. And fifth and finally, and most important, you do a penance some kind of public humiliation that symbolizes that you did indeed screw up and that you know it. Okay. And when you've gone through those five steps, you're forgiven. And until you go through those five steps, you're not. Exxon hasn't done it. And it's not that oil spills are unforgivable. I mean, uh, BP had an oil spill in, 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 in the Long Beach area and, and did a superb job of cleaning up and a superb job of apologizing. The image is higher in the vicinity of the spill than it was before the spill. Uh, before uh, Exxon Valdez, uh, Ashland had a spill in the Monongahela. Same thing. Okay? And if you've never heard of the Monongahela spill and you've never heard of the BP spill, that proves my point. Third component of responsive process, and the last one I want to talk about, uh, and in some ways the most important one, is the distinction between responding to people's concerns caringly and responding to people's concerns technocratically. Okay. And let, let me stereotype a little bit, and I'm going to pick on engineers. 
Engineers are, I think, people who, by disposition, don't like this kind of soft thinking. Okay? They like hard data, preferably data that's quantified, preferably data that they can do and deal with in a laboratory and they won't have to deal with any people. And the training of engineers uh, exacerbates those traits, right? You, you, you learn to keep your emotion out of your work. You learn to keep uh, uh, your opinion out of your work. You learn, in fact, to keep yourself out of your work. You learn to use the passive voice. Engineers don't do anything. It is done. Okay. Uh, that is to say, engineers are weird. Okay. <laughs> or, or in their own language, they are, they are about uh, uh, three sigmas from the mean. Okay. <laughs> If you've, ever, if you've ever played with Myers-Briggs and, and other mechanisms, other, other, other devices for measuring this stuff, I mean, the data are very clear. Engineers are peculiar people. Uh, normal people, when they get upset, turn red in the face. Engineers turn white in the face. Uh, normal people, when they get upset, uh, uh, use more emotional language. Engineers use less emotional language. They try to be as much like the equipment as possible. Now, on the other side of our risk controversy is the concerned housewife. And if you are both a concerned housewife and an engineer, you can be twice mad at me. Okay. Okay. Now, she's, she's not as interested in data as he is. Unlike him, she thinks that anecdotes are much more reliable, much more believable than abstract data arrays. Uh, she thinks of her Aunt Martha's cancer as a tragedy and a warning. She doesn't think of it as an outlier in a data array. Okay. Uh, she thinks people who can't express their feelings shouldn't be trusted with anything much less an important risk. Okay? She's not as weird as he is. She's two sigmas out in the other direction. Okay? And risk controversies are battles between these two individuals. He doesn't want to be there. You can tell because he's sounding even more technical than usual. Okay? That pushes all her buttons. That makes her emotional. That makes him more technical. That makes her more emotional. That makes him more technical. Eventually, she is shaking her, shaking her leukemic child in his face. Okay? He is staring cataleptic at his printout. <laughs> the, the, the classic confrontation, right? The uncaring technocrat versus the hysterical housewife. And it's a setup. It's terribly unfair. He is not uncaring. He cares deeply. She is not hysterical. She understands the data. They did that to each other, and it's your job not to let it happen. How do you do that? How do you not let it happen? It's, it's a matter of understanding that an interaction with a citizen about risk is first and foremost a human interaction. I am not suggesting that engineers can't do it. Engineers are human. Uh, they are, in fact, as good at being human as the rest of us once they understand that being human is what's called for, that the skills they have with their spouse, with their children, at a cocktail party are much more relevant than the skills they have as an engineer. Uh, and that when you're talking to someone who's very concerned, it's human skills, it's listening, it's storytelling, it's compassion that's called for much more than the skills of data manipulation. That's the list of 12. Let me give you now very quickly a list of eight more. I think these eight are not as important as the other 12, but they often do turn up. Uh, as important, and I think they're worth knowing about. Number 13, then, is effect on vulnerable populations. We tend to worry much less about workers than we do about citizens in general. And we worry much less about citizens in general than we do about particularly vulnerable citizens, such as old people and sick people and particularly children. So whether you've got an occupational risk, which is, which is least concerning to people, or an environmental risk, which is more concerning, or a risk to very vulnerable populations, which is still more concerning, is, is a matter of, of, of some importance. Number 14 is the distinction between risks that have delayed effects and risks that have immediate effects. We take risks much more seriously when they seem to lie in wait for us. Okay, when, when, you know, when, when we feel that they're, they're trapping us, then we do when the effect is immediate. Now, it turns out that's exactly the opposite of what risk assessors do. Risk assessors discount okay, for delayed risk on, on the perfectly rational basis that it's better to, to die in 40 years than it is to die tomorrow. Okay? So risk assessors discount 40 years later uh, this, uh, for dying the same way they do for interest. Okay. The public, on the other hand, sees the treacherous uh, 
delayed risk as a more serious outrage. Number 15 is effect on future generations. Citizens seem to take very seriously whether this is going to affect their great, 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 great grandchildren. Uh, will, will the uh, landfill leak in 200 years? Okay? And, and will this damage the people who live here then? Risk assessors, of course, are discounting. By the time you get to 200 years, almost no risk is a serious risk to a risk assessor. Okay? And engineers have, of course, sort of a, a classic, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Uh, frame of mind that says, if it's 200 years off, some 200 year from now engineer with 200 year from now engineering skills will solve it, and I'm not going to worry about it now. All very reasonable, but all ignoring the outrage that attaches to future generations. Number 16 is the identifiability of the victim. We used to call this the Bambi syndrome, okay, or, or my wife calls it the little girl in the well phenomenon. Okay, and uh, most people uh, take a risk much more seriously if, if it is symbolized by an identifiable victim. On the other hand, statistical victims, victims that don't have names, that you can't take pictures of, are a source of very considerably less outrage. Number 17 is the distinction between preventability and reducibility. Risks that can be prevented entirely, that are yes or no, on or off, generate a whole lot more outrage than risks that can only be reduced, that are more or less. I think it's just more satisfying to stop a facility or to prevent a facility than it is to mitigate a facility. Okay? So whenever you get a, an on-off risk, you're going to kind of get a little bit of juice added to the outrage by virtue of the fact that it's preventable rather than merely reducible. Number 18 is the ratio of benefit to risk. Now, I told you earlier that, in my judgment, risk-benefit ratios aren't terribly important. They turn up most important as an aspect of fairness, because people are very interested in the risk-benefit ratio to them. Am I getting enough benefit to compensate for the risk that I'm enduring? But it turns out that even the total risk-benefit ratio does play a role. Not as important a role as risk assessors would like it to play, but it does play a role. It belongs on the B list. Uh, to my judgment, it's surprising, in fact, that people do care as much as they do about how senseless or sensible, uh, worth it or not worth it, the risk is. Uh, people show surprisingly uh, much attention to that and, and willingness to be altruistic about whether there is benefit somewhere in the system. Number 19 is media attention. Now, I think media attention is mostly a result variable. Okay? The media respond to outrage. They stick a microphone in front of outrage. They cover it. They don't create it. Okay? But they do amplify it. There's no question that, that, that when the media stick a microphone in front of outrage, uh, they make it bigger, they attract more people to it, they give it attention. Okay? So, so the, uh, the media effect is important. Number 20, and the last one I'm going to cover today, is opportunity for collective action. Outrage feeds on outrage. Okay? More from friends and neighbors than from activists or from the media. Okay? If your neighbor is outraged and, and she tells you about it at the beauty parlor or he tells you about it at the, at the, at the, at the barber shop, okay, the outrage builds, the outrage generates. And risks that are open to that, risks where collective action is possible. Okay? For example, a proposed industrial facility where you can say, let's have a meeting, okay? are going to generate more outrage because the vehicles are there. Risks like radon, for example, where it wouldn't make much sense to have a meeting, where the risk strikes individual by individual, home by home, are going to generate less outrage because there's less potential for collective action. Okay. Now, these 20 are not all there is to risk communication by any means. There's, uh, there are other outrage factors. And outrage isn't the only thing in risk communication either. There's lots of stuff we haven't talked about. We haven't talked about audiences and identifying all the different kinds of people. I've, I've been talking very glibly about the public. But there is no the public. There are lots of publics. Uh, there, so so I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that these 20 outrage factors are all there is to risk, to risk communication. They are, though, I think, a very important handle on risk communication. 
The first conclusion, in deciding how risky something is, people are going to pay a whole lot more attention to outrage than they are to hazard. That's inevitable. Even when people understand the difference between hazard and outrage, they are still much more attentive to outrage than to hazard. Now let's look again at the, at the A list, at the list of 12 factors. That means that for, for publics, for communities, for everybody except the risk assessor in his office, okay, what matters is, is it voluntary or is it coerced? Is it natural or industrial? Is it familiar or exotic? Uh, is it memorable? Can we, you know, can we remember screw-ups? Uh, is it particularly dreaded? Is it chronic or, or catastrophic? Is it knowable or not? You know, can, is it detectable? Is, is the uncertainty high? Uh, can it be controlled individually? Is the risk fair? Is it morally relevant or morally irrelevant? Are people lying to us about it? Are the sources trustworthy or untrustworthy? And are you dealing with us honestly or not so honestly? Look, 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 now think about the risks that you deal with. I would argue for a lot of the risks that industry and government is busy trying to say to people, hey, it's not really risky. Okay. What are those risks like? They're coerced, not voluntary. They're industrial, not natural. They're exotic, not familiar. We can all remember screw-ups. Cancer is particularly dread. Uh, uh, the catastrophe is a real possibility. Uncertainty and expert disagreement and undetectability are all very high. You won't share the knife. The benefits aren't fairly distributed. Pollution is morally relevant. You can't be trusted. And you talk to people technocratically instead of compassionately. For all those reasons, even if we stipulate that the hazard genuinely is low, the risk is still high. When you go into a community and you say, hey, it's not really risky, the main reason they don't believe you is you're flat out wrong. Second conclusion, the supremacy of outrage over hazard isn't the fault of activists or the fault of the media. They, I mean, it's true that activists in the media are in the outrage business. I mean, they go around looking for outrages. Their skills are skills at managing and manipulating and, 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 and amplifying outrage. There's no question that that's true. There's also no question in my mind that that's honorable, that, that paying attention to outrage and bringing outrages to the attention of the public is important work and, and good work. Okay. But what, what we need to understand is activists and reporters don't create outrage. They harvest it. Okay. I mean, I sit in meetings with activists, and we sit there and we say, well, where's a good outrage that we can, that we can attach ourselves to? That, you know, where's a, a ripe outrage, that's, that, that's, that, 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 a plum that's ripe to be harvested? Okay. So, I mean, there's, I think there's a tendency on the part of, of industry and government experts to think, well, this is all the fault of the media. If the media wouldn't cover this stuff, if the activists wouldn't make a fuss, it wouldn't happen. And they're not creating the outrage. You are. Okay? They're taking advantage of it. Number three, people don't listen very much to hazard data when they're experiencing high outrage. Nobody pays a lot of attention to the charts and graphs when they're busy collecting rocks to throw at your car. Okay. In fact, the only rational use to make of, of hazard data when outrage is high, either you ignore it or you harvest it for ammunition. Okay. And as you know, I mean, citizens are very good at going through a 200-page environmental report or a 200-page uh, health study 20 minutes before the public hearing and finding that one embarrassing paragraph to stick you with. Okay. They're very good at harvesting even reassuring data for ammunition okay, because the outrage is high. Now, that's, that's not unique to risk. I mean, I, I think that's a special case of something we all know in our lives. In any relationship with your spouse, with your, with your children, with your, uh, your boss or, or the people who work for you, when there is strong emotion on the table, the substantive issue becomes merely ammunition. I think, that's, I think that's a universal experience. And what it means in risk communication is as long as the outrage is high, nobody's going to learn from the data that the hazard is low. They're just not going to do it. Conclusion four. Outrage isn't just a distraction from hazard. Okay? It's also an important, legitimate issue in its own right. Okay? And, and 
I can't stress that too much. I mean, it is true that outrage is a distraction from hazard. I mean, to the extent that we worry about high outrage, low hazard risks, we have less time, less money, less attention, less energy left to worry about high hazard, low outrage risks. And in that sense, the public's focus on outrage kills people. There's no question that that's true. But that's only half the truth. The other half the truth is nobody in this room wants to live in a world that focuses on hazard and ignores outrage. Let's go back to the list of 12 again. I'll start from the bottom this time. We want to we wanna live in a world where people are responsive uh, uh, to each other, where the process is compassionate. We want to live in a world where sources are trustworthy. We want to live in a world that pays attention to moral values, where benefits are fairly distributed, where communities have control over their own lives, and so on and up, on up the list. This list of 12 and the larger list of 20 is not some list of alien Martian values. These are our values. You share them. You don't really want to let them go. When the public insists on treating outrage as part of risk, it's not being muddle-headed. What it's doing is acknowledging that outrage is important, that it really wants high outrage risks to be taken more seriously than low outrage risks, and that it knows the way you do that is to treat outrage as part of risk. That's not muddle-headedness. It is a kind of wisdom, and it's a kind of wisdom that even technical experts share when they put aside their technical hat. Conclusion five. In situations where the hazard is high, the job of risk communication is to nurture the outrage. Okay. Now, that's the situation we agreed at the beginning of the speech I wouldn't talk much about today. Okay. But it's important. You know, where, where the hazard is high, what you do is try to get more outrage. Outrage is the engine that gets attention to serious hazards. Wonderful example of that is, is mothers against drunk driving. Okay, there's a serious hazard that uh, MAD turned into a serious outrage and got progress on the hazard. Okay, another risk issue uh, where that's been done superbly is passive smoking. Now, passive smoking is less than 10% of the smoking hazard. It's over 90% of the smoking outrage. It's over 90% of the media coverage. It's over 90% of the regulatory activity. Passive smoking as an issue has already saved tens of thousands of lives, 90% of them the lives of smokers who barely deserve it. Okay. Now, okay. that's what environmentalists do. I think it's very important work. Where the hazard is high, that's what the job is, to goose the outrage. Conclusion six, when the hazard is low, the job of risk communicators is exactly the opposite, to reduce the outrage. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's not also important to explain the hazard. No one should go home from this presentation and say, uh, Sandman, expert in risk communication, says, don't bother explaining the hazard, that's not the issue. I mean, you want to see outrage, try not explaining the hazard to people. I mean, you have a, a moral and a legal and a political obligation to explain the hazard data. So I'm not saying don't do that. Okay? What I'm saying is that's not the core job. That's not the central job that's missing. The central job that's missing where the hazard is low is to reduce the outrage. Once again, let's look at that list of 12. Okay? There they are. What am I talking about? Find ways to ask permission. Don't compare risks you're imposing on people to natural risks. Acknowledge the way, you know, I'm sorry, make the risk more familiar. You know, talk about it, explain it, make the risk more familiar. Acknowledge the ways in which the risk is memorable. Get those, that memorable stuff on the table. Okay? Acknowledge the dread, legitimate the dread. Take catastrophe more seriously. Increase the knowability. Remember that, that uh, uh, sign on the roof of the incinerator. Find ways to make the risk more knowable. Share the knife. Share the benefits more fairly. Acknowledge the moral relevance of pollution. Build trust and don't demand too much trust. And finally, respond to people honestly, openly, apologetically when you've screwed up, and caringly with compassion for their concerns. That's the risk communication agenda. It's not all about explaining 10 to the minus 6. It's not all about getting parts per billion clearer. It's not about charts and graphs. It's not about explaining the data. Yeah, you have to do that. Okay. But you're already doing that and doing it pretty well. The big issue, the underexplored issue, the, you know, the, the one where there's a lot of progress to be made is finding ways to reduce the outrage.
Seventh and final conclusion, that companies and agencies usually can't reduce outrage until they make some progress in changing their own organizations. What are the organizational barriers to taking outrage reduction seriously? There are things like job descriptions, performance appraisals, internal climate of opinion. I, I had an agency person say to me a few weeks ago, how can, I, how can we level with the public? We don't level with each other. Okay. Uh, it's matters of whether, whether a new policy strikes employees as the kind of policy they're supposed to take seriously or the kind of policy they're supposed to pay lip service to. Both kinds exist. Everybody who, who succeeds in an organization knows there are policies you're supposed to do and there are policies you're supposed to pretend to do. And what signals which is which? It might be budget, it might be who gets promoted, who gets fired, but people can tell. And I talked to a plant manager and he said, well, why should I pay any, you know, why should I think they mean the new environmental policy? They didn't mean the old environmental policy. Okay. And in situations like that, you're not going to have progress. Okay. If it doesn't pay a plant manager to level with the community, he isn't going to level with the community. The last plant manager shoved all the problems under the rug and he got promoted. Uh, why, why should this plant manager think the right solution is to level with the community, let the outrage out, endure a considerable amount of conflict, maybe, uh, 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 maybe some slowdown in productivity, maybe some capital cost to put in uh, equipment that the community demands, maybe you're going to read about it in the Wall Street Journal. Is all of that going to make the boss happy? Okay. Maybe not. So lots of companies and lots of agencies have adopted risk communication as a policy that they're not yet sure they mean. At the moment, most agencies, most companies are kind of at the edge. Okay, they're on the edge. They are announcing risk communication policies that are radical changes from the past. They are talking about leveling with the public. They are talking about sharing power. They are talking about building trust and building in accountability. They're talking the right language. And that's real progress. But it's not yet cemented into the company. It's not yet cemented into the agency. There's still kind of a, a sense, we're not sure if we mean it. Okay? Our employees aren't sure. Our publics aren't sure. And we're not even sure. Now, I'm not skeptical about that. I mean, that's a stage. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has a wonderful slogan, fake it till you make it. Okay. I think that's where industry and government are today on risk communication. They're faking it. They may, I think they will, begin to mean it for real. Okay. Let's summarize this in terms of four stages. I mean, in, in just five years, it seems to me we have had four stages of risk communication. The first stage I would call the stonewall stage. The public doesn't understand risk, will never understand risk. Ignore them. The second stage was the missionary stage. Okay, we've got to educate them. Let's explain to people that it's only 17 parts per million and it's only one, you know, one chance in a million that they're going to die and they shouldn't worry about it. Everything's under control. And the third stage, which began only a couple of years ago, was the dialogue stage. And we're still in the dialogue stage, where we're understanding that explaining to the public the ways in which we're right is only half the job, and it's the less important half. The half that we've been ignoring is listening to the public about the ways in which they're right and working out how we can reduce the outrage. The fourth stage, which we're just entering, I would call the organizational stage. That stage begins with the awareness that knowing what to do and being able to do it are different. And you know, that shouldn't surprise me so much. My message to you, after all, is that you can't just say to people, hey, here's the hazard data, and have them believe it. Okay? So it should come as no surprise to me that you also can't just say to people, hey, here's the outrage data and expect that they're going to go act on it. It requires work. It requires organizational change. It takes time. But the first step is to see that it can be done. Okay. I hope we've made progress toward that first step today. Thank you. people have energy left, I would be real happy to respond to questions. Sir, how about that time of all situation? Wasn't that well handled? <laughs>
Tylenol is a superb example of beautifully handled risk communication. And I have to tell you that the CEO of Johnson & Johnson was dragging lawyers every step of the way. I mean, he, you know, he sort of walked in. Do you remember this? I mean, this was the, the cyanide poisoning. And, and he walked into a forest of microphones on a, on a worldwide uh, satellite news conference. And he said, it's our fault. It was wonderful communication because everybody watching was thinking, wait a minute, it's not your fault. I mean, you know, some crazy person tampered with your package. It's not your fault. And there he is on stage with an audience of 60 million people or so saying, it's our job to make sure you can't tamper with our package. It's our fault. You can't do better PR than to have 60 million people arguing with you that it's not your fault. <laughs> okay. It's a wonderful example of if you take responsibility you know, a lot can be achieved. Very often lawyers won't let you say it's our fault and what a lot of companies have discovered as, a, as an almost satisfactory replacement is, is, and BP did this in Long Beach, it was wonderful. What BP said in Long Beach is, our lawyers tell us it's not our fault, but we feel like it's our fault and we're going to act as if it was our fault. Okay. And it was wonderful, the lawyer went home saying, thank God they said it's not their fault. And absolutely everybody else went home saying, I can't believe they said it's their fault. Okay. So that might be a formula that would work for you. Other questions? Sure. We didn't talk too much tonight about the communicator himself or herself. How important is the communications ability of that individual versus the message that they're trying to portray? Very good question. Uh, how important is it? Who's doing the communication? Uh, and the answer, of course, is it's enormously important. Uh, there are some very strong demographic correlates, by the way, uh, particularly gender. Fourteen of the ten best risk communicators in the country are women. Uh, I mean, they, they say of me, he's pretty good for a man. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not sure why that's true, but it's, it's visibly true that women have much more credibility, much, have a much easier time listening and hearing and responding sensitively and compassionately than men do. Um, uh, and there are other, other correlates. The, the basic advice, too, uh, when, you, when you're talking about choosing communicators, uh, is, the, is the advice your mother gave you. You remember your mother saying, it's really a matter of attitude? Okay, you know, you, you got to change your attitude. I don't know about you, I was terribly frustrated by that. I, you know, tell me how to change my behavior. I don't, I don't know how to change my attitude. Uh, but, but in fact, there's a lot of truth there. You know, I mean, if you basically think the public is idiotic, okay, and it's really stupid to be talking to these lay people when you could be out there solving real problems, that's going to show through, no matter how much risk communication training you get. Uh, it, you know, and if you've got someone on your staff who feels that way, uh, you know, training is not going to help a lot. Keep them, keep them inside. Keep them in the closet, okay? <laughs> and and send to deal with the public people who think the public deserves to be dealt with. What else? Anything else? Just to summarize what you've said, uh, as these issues con confront industry, it's best to try to diffuse them immediately, opposed to letting them get uh, with a lot of inertia uh, built up, such as uh, nuclear power, such as acid rain, where the people uh, and uh, environmental groups become very polarized against, uh, against the issues, and they're very hard to uh, then talk rationally about the subject. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you raised it the way you did. I mean, I, I think, I think it's, it's very easy for me, it's an easy sell for me to convince a company that they need to take risk communication seriously and they need to take outrage reduction seriously after they've been badly burned. Okay? I mean, some of them don't even learn then. I think the nuclear power industry, you know, which has certainly been badly burned, still is having trouble absorbing the notion that it has to deal with people uh, in, in, in a different way than it's used to. But certainly the chemical industry, the petroleum industry, the food industry, the pesticide industry, a lot of industries have figured that out. It's much harder. It's a much tougher sell with a company or an agency that hasn't been burned. Okay. And your analysis, I think, is exactly right. I mean, the easiest time, I mean, the best time to do maintenance on any system is when the demands on the system are light. Okay. And the best time to do maintenance on your relationship with the community is when it's not stressed, when outrage isn't high. But that's a hard sell. It's, very, I mean, it's hard to convince people because, after all, if you do a good job of keeping outrage low, you won't think you needed to do the job at all. Okay, I mean, where risk communication is good and outrage is low, the boss is saying, why are we spending all this money on risk communication? There's no problem. 
Now, we've learned that in other areas of risk, right? I mean, the boss doesn't say, let's take out all those pressure relief valves. No, no tank is exploding. Okay? We understand we put the pressure relief valve in when the tank isn't exploding. Okay? And we maintain it, and we test it, and we keep it, and we take it seriously, and we budget for it because we don't want a tank to explode next year. Okay? It's, it's harder to sell that for risk communication, for, for community relations as a maintenance task. But you're absolutely right. It is easier, it is more useful before the rocks are thrown. I, as a consultant, I have two rates. I charge more after they're throwing rocks. Thank you. <laughs>